Um, so uh, that's why this part is really important to get it right. You know, it's hard to do virtual both images. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to the 2021 Heart Mountain Pilgrimage. And today we are honoring former incarcerated Sam Mahara, who was a tireless advocate for Heart Mountain. After the grand opening in 2011, Sam visited me in my office in Washington, D.C., and he knocked on my door and he said he wanted to get involved. He said the grand opening was life changing for him, that he had really shifted his perspective and he wanted to join, he wanted me to be an educator. I can safely say that one of the best decisions I made was to bring Sam Mahara on the board of directors. Because since that time, he has spent countless hours traveling around the country, reaching over 65,000 people, schools and colleges by the hundreds in the United States. And I'll tell you one thing, that he has donated every dollar back to Heart Mountain and has been one of our significant fundraisers to keep our foundation in this building going. So thank you, Sam. So even though I physically have known Sam for 10 years, I've known Sam spiritually before I was born. And I've learned to know more about my mother who passed away in 2005 through the eyes of Sam Mahara. My father and mother met at Heart Mountain but what I learned after talking to Sam Mahara is he knew my mother before the war. They were actually friends. They were family friends. And this archival photo, my mother, Setsko, here with her younger brother, little Sam, adorable, cute Mahara, in the middle, <laughs> knew my mother, loved our family, admired my uncles, and talked so wonderfully about my mother that I didn't even recognize who he was talking about. <laughs> I mean, is this the same mother that I, you know, but um, what it is is that the blessing that I've had in my life through Sam's work is that I have gotten to know my mother better and more completely and more honestly after having Sam join the board. And part of it is, is that he's preserving not only his own history, but the history of my family, the history of your families, and the history of Heart Mountain, which makes it so important that today that we are dedicating this theater in his honor, and we will continue to work with Sam tirelessly with the teacher workshops that we just completed for two weeks where he was one of our instructors. And I have to tell you, his book, blindsided, and his talks brought the teachers to tears. All 72 of them across the country from California, Florida, East Coast, DC, moved to tears. And that's the significance of Sam's ability to bring the power place to classrooms and also supporting the power place here at Heart Mountain. So thank you very much, Sam Mahara. And we welcome you. What do we do next? Oh, oh, okay. Now, oh, before, and Sam, come up here, but I want to give you the sense, like, I wasn't born yet. I know people somehow think I'm, but this is <laughs> a lot older than I really am. Uh, so that was pre-war. Little cute Sam Mahara with my mother. There is uh, my mother, Seth with my late uncle and Sam behind after the war. Isn't that amazing? And then there's uh, one, the next photo, if uh, Dakota has it. <laughs> oh, there it is. And there's uh, Sam and then my uncle, um, Taisho, who's, who, uh, is in, uh, who, who died tragically in a car accident. So, um, Sam, I've known you before I was born. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Dakota, before you go away, can you go back to the, third, the first slide? I want to point out something that is very, very significant. 
Okay, on this, whoops, you missed it. Okay, well, I want to point out there's something that is very significant in this photograph. You notice the Saitos are well mannered, they're waiting for having <laughs> others feed themselves, drink themselves for. But there's one guy in the middle with two fisted eating and drinking before him. Well, I had no manners. I wasn't taught manners, but the Saitos were. So I thought oh, that's a very important part of the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Where's my binder? Oh, <laughs> no binder, no speech. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, in order to start, I want to simply say thank you to all those involved in making this, uh, this uh, ceremony possible. You know, certainly Shirley and Doug uh, as chair and vice chair in Dakota and all the work you've done. And also uh, Kathy Ewell and, and Claudia Wade as uh, co-chairs of the pilgrimage committee did a lot of work and I appreciate that very much. And, and of course, I, I can't go without mentioning Julie as uh, Julie Abos. Uh, all I can say is she's the person who makes everything work. And so without her, we wouldn't be here. And, and I really appreciate the hours. And of course, all of my friends on the board, uh, uh, I really appreciate their, their support. But back in the year uh, 2011, when this building was uh, dedicated, uh, I did something that most people would think I'm crazy. I came out of retirement uh, and uh, took on a new job. And uh, I gave away all the money. Uh, and so here's my story. So years ago, after graduating from Berkeley and, and uh, UCLA uh, graduate school with uh, engineering degrees, I was hired by the Boeing Company and had a great, great career. 42 years working, developing airplanes and rockets and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. And, and then after I retired, I, I really started getting into the world of leisure, enjoying myself, traveling a lot, uh, fly fishing all over the world, uh, helping the grandkids grow up. Uh, and so that, that was a, a great part of my life. But then in, in 2011, uh, just after this learn learning center was opened, uh, I got a call from Christy Fleming. And uh, Christy, where are you here? Oh, where? oh, she disappeared. Oh my, okay. Uh, Christy called me in California. She was here in her office right here. And then she said, uh, I had a call from um, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Cheyenne, and uh, they said, uh, we're looking for a speaker, uh, somebody with experience in the camp. And so I said, well, th that's me. I'm one of them. And um, they wanted somebody who can talk about this life. And also, then Christy asked me, can I speak? And I said, well, sure. I, I've spoken about rockets and airplanes for a long time, but that's no problem. <laughs> But I said, you know, see, there are travel expenses. And she says, all travel expenses are covered. I said, oh, I'm your man. I'm, I'm it. <laughs> I'm on my way. When do I go? So uh, I, I knew I could speak about internment, you know, my, about my experience in the camp. That was no problem. Uh, but I needed to be better prepared. I knew that because I needed to know about the important historical events that happened, you know, especially why we were uh, removed from our home. So, so I studied these and I looked for, for photographs that are important evidence of the of things that happened. And so knowing that the group is uh, lawyers, I, I really wanted to know about uh, important cases like Korhatsu case and the Endo case and, and understand you know, why they became quite important. So I, and I studied Executive Order 9066 and learned about its history. I learned about John DeWitt, General DeWitt, Major uh, Carl Bendetson and their backgrounds. And, and they're the ones, by the way, who, who authorized in writing the removal of our, within our military district. And I found the granddaughter of uh, Dorothy Lang in Santa Fe. And I interviewed her and found out about why her grandmother took such outstanding photographs, you know, showing evidence of, the, of the, the meanness of the government in forcing us to move using armed soldiers. Uh, and then I talked to Dale Minami, who was an expert. He was the lead attorney uh, on the Korematsu case. And so I asked him, now, what made Korematsu and Endo case so important and famous? And he told me about that. 
Uh, and I interviewed the son of James Purcell, the lead attorney who filed the Endo case. And now I'm, I'm really ready. I'm armed with all this information. And I came to, uh, to um, Cheyenne and went to the um, federal building on the top floor. It was a, a large conference room. There were about 100 attorneys. And they're all seated in order of rank. The U.S. attorney and the assistants are in the front row. And they have a bunch of, you know, more senior or middle senior. And then at the very end, at the last of the youngest, the new start young kids and just out of law school. And that was OK. And so I thought about asking the question, the start of the, the talk. How many of you have heard of Fred Korematsu? Would you believe the front row? No one raised their hand in the middle. No one raised in the last row, the three young kids raise their hand. Three out of 97% never heard of court. And they're lawyers. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, to, I thought to myself, this is easy. These guys know nothing about what happened. <laughs> so I went through my, my speech, you know, and, and, uh, and they gave me a nice ovation. And then I found out the lead attorney, uh, uh, Kip Crofts, he, uh, he got on his computer after the talk and he went and sent a message out to all the other Attorney, U.S. attorneys in the country said, you, you, you got to hear Sam. This is a pretty good story. And I got uh, calls from uh, Washington, New York, San Diego, L.A., San Francisco, uh, asking me to come and speak. So that, that was the start of, of my, my talking, because uh, speaking to these uh, professional attorneys about something new, they knew very little about. And I was, I was shocked. And when I started talking all over the country, I found a similar case. A lot of people haven't heard about what happened. And so my, my thought is, well, I, I better get the story out to these people. They really need to know ab about what happened. So as a result, uh, I've reached over 65,000 uh, students of all ages, starting from fourth grade through high school, college people, and seniors. And and, uh, and it's been as small as one person as in, and large as 1,500 uh, assembly of an entire school. And so these are all people who know a lot more, and hopefully they'll make sure this kind of injustice doesn't happen again. And of course, uh, like you heard, uh, all of my speaking fees are forwarded to the, the foundation here, and, and that's what's quite important. But, but, you know, to me, the most rewarding is the fact that uh, uh, these people are being educated and they're learning about injustice. And, you know, I watched my father go blind here. I watched my grandfather die a horrible death, and I don't want that to happen to anyone at all. And so I'm, I'm really grateful. And, and uh, the lesson learned here is that, you know, there's nothing as satisfying as helping people learn about what happened and make sure this hidden history is no longer hidden and everyone should know that you, will, you know, all of, everyone will have a better life. They'll enjoy life better knowing that they've helped others and they've helped them in a way of both uh, in, information and knowledge as well as money in order to help make a, a, a better life. So Shirley and the rest of the people, thank you all very much. I appreciate the honor and uh, my sincere thanks to everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted that photograph and that photograph. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks so much. And it's really our great pleasure to honor Sam, who has done so much to raise awareness about Heart Mountain Insight around the nation, uh, around the world, really. Uh, and uh, who, of course, has uh, uh, also used those speaking fees to make many things possible here, and including improvements to the center theater here. Uh, for those of you who are watching us online, I do want to take just a moment to remind you that uh, 
Uh, yesterday, we announced an exciting new initiative uh, also related to education here at Heart Mountain. The Mineta Simpson Institute, a planned expansion to our museum, a new wing that's going to house a full retreat center that will let us connect better with our many, many school groups who visit the center, but also to hold teacher workshops, to hold workshops for politicians, community leaders, the people who are going to shape our future, to bring them out here and to really stress to them the power of place and the lessons that can be learned from the uh, Japanese American incarceration so that we don't wind up going down the same sorts of roads that led to this, the roads of the politics of fear and anger so that we can keep our heads, so that we can follow the example of Norman, Norm Mineta and Alan Simpson and to work together to reach across the aisle uh, to build a better tomorrow. Um, for those of you who are joining us online, please rejoin uh, at 2. Uh, we'll be reconvening with an office of incarceration. But right now, though, I want to pass you over to our development manager, Denny Hirsch. She's going to tell you a little bit more about the Mineta Simpson Institute and what we need to do to make that a reality. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Denny Hirsch. Um, membership and development manager here at Heart Mountain Inst uh, Wyoming Foundation. And it really is time to honor the commitment of Normanetta and Alan Simpson. From the moment the creators of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation first started talking about building something at the site, where almost 14,000 Japanese Americans were incarcerated, Norman Mineta and Alan Simpson were here. They initially met in camp as Boy Scouts in 1943 when Norm was a young Heart Mountain incarceree from San Jose, California. And Al came with his troop from Cody, Wyoming, when no other outside troops would dare to attend. A, they came for a Boy Scout jamboree. Many years later, Norm would lead the way for the commission that exposed the wrongs of the incarceration to the entire country, and then push for the Civil Liberties Act while Al would help bring his fellow Republicans into the fight for justice. So these two men, two young boys that met at camp, um, one a Democrat, one a Republican, learned how to cross partisan blinders and party lines while working on solutions for all Americans. And they realized that that was a model for good governance while they were serving in Congress. And that's the, the inspiring legacy we wish to honor with the creation of the Mineta Simpson Institute at Heart Mountain. We're starting the serious work of raising money. So it's more important than ever to remember and lift up what Al and Norm have done for our country and for our foundation and to follow their example. We're building the new Mineta Simpson Institute at Heart Mountain to expand the facilities here and to develop new programming, as Dakota said, that will take our story beyond the confines of Wyoming to the rest of the world. We hope to hold our ribbon cutting for the Institute in two years, so we have a lot of work to do. We've already received several generous donations and we are um, at the one point, over $1.5 million. So, we hope that everyone who's watching and people who are participating live will join in this campaign and help us raise the money to build an institute that will honor the legacy of Norm Mineta and Alan Simpson and also look to the future so that we can continue their work of bringing people together and helping people understand why it is so important that we never forget what this country did and what it can do so much better in the future to never um, imprison its own people, no matter what they look like, no matter what they believe, we are all Americans. Thank you very much. And I hope that we can all count, we can count on all of your support. 